Hi there, and welcome to a special U.S. election briefing hosted by the American Society of the University of Haifa. Today, we are joined by Professor Eli Cook, Senior Lecturer in History and Head of the American Studies Program at the University of Haifa. Professor Cook received his PhD from Harvard in 2013 and specializes in the political, economic, and cultural history of the modern United States. Professor, uh, a lot to unpack here, uh, as 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 uh, as we are here one day before November third, before Election Day. Many people, uh, many people thought this day, uh, you know, would would might might never never arrive. It seemed like it's been uh, it's been on our doorstep for for a long, long time now. Um, as we sit here a day before Election Day, what are the most recent updates you're seeing uh, in the polls that you're that you, that you're that you're analyzing and speaking with some of your colleagues? Um, what are kind of some updates that you're seeing? So what's remarkable about this election is that no matter what crazy things seem to be happening around us, whether it's the pandemic or protest, uh, the polls have been remarkably consistent. And so what we've seen in the last few days is what we've seen for the last three months and actually what we've seen almost for the last year. And that is that Joe Biden has a consistent and steady lead over Donald Trump. Uh, on the other hand, we see also that there are a few key battleground states where it would take only maybe a slight or a little bit more than a slight polling error to make it interesting. But generally, if I compare it to 2016, for instance, uh, national polls, uh, Biden is up almost eight points if you take a kind of average of the polls and Hillary Clinton is this time was uh, up less than three. So really different. We, we, as you mentioned, a lot of Americans, actually the world, saw the polls um, kind of get it wrong in 2016, right? Should, would you advise Americans to, 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 to put their trust in those polls, or would you look at them with some skepticism, uh, given what happened in, in 2016? I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I think, first of all, people need to remember that it was, in many ways, it was the pundits who failed the American people more than the polls. If you look at the last polls right before the election in 2016, and this is after the Comey letter came out, it was very clear that there was tightening. Uh, now, there were mistakes in some key state polls in 2016, mostly in those now famous Rust Belt uh, states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, which everyone thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And we know that now they've tried to correct those errors. The problem in 2016 was that they didn't take enough account into the class dynamic of the American voter and how white working class voters were moving towards Trump. And therefore they didn't weigh enough the amount of working class voters they had in their samples. Uh, I can promise you they wouldn't make that mistake again. They've learned their lesson, but of course, we can never uh, assume that the polls are perfect and absolutely there could be something else that we're missing here. And that's why at the end of the day, even though it really does look like Biden is going to win, there is definitely a pass path through Pennsylvania where T Trump could again uh, kind of surprise everyone and win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What have you seen from President Trump? Um, or Vice President uh, or, or former Vice President Joe Biden over the past week or so? How, how are they spending their time? Where are they spending their time? And are they focusing on particular messages as, they, as, as we closed in on uh, November 3? Well, first of all, they're spending a lot of time in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned before, that really is the key state this time, especially for Donald Trump. He has almost no path to win without taking uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but even for Biden, if you look at the states that Biden needs, if he loses Pennsylvania, he's leading in the polls, but they're mostly southern states, places like Arizona and Florida and Texas and North Carolina, which can traditionally be Republican. So a lot of talk in Pennsylvania, a lot of talk about, again, those white working class voters, uh, a lot of kind of, you know, attempts from both sides to kind of bring out a more kind of maybe economic populist argument that you don't often see in general elections. Uh, but I think other than that, what you're seeing is that Joe Biden is leading, leaning heavily on Barack Obama. Uh, the reason Biden became the candidate, I think we can all agree, was because he had been the vice president to Obama. And he basically is running on a campaign to bring back kind of uh, uh, the normalcy, as he would call it, of the Obama uh, 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 administration. And Trump, on the other hand, I think is trying mostly to get people to forget about the pandemic that's raging outside. I think he's also trying to 
create uh, some doubt among voters about uh, the mail-in votes because I think he feels that that's a weakness for him. And so he, uh, in some ways, is kind of pinning this notion that only the votes that count on election day should count, which of course is wrong. Any uh, vote that arrives after election day will also be counted. Uh, other than that, I think it's the usual message for both of them. Uh, Trump is, you know, his usual boisterous self and Biden plays it, you know, very calm, very collective. He's not really running a campaign for Joe Biden. He's running a campaign against Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. A record number of Americans uh, have voted, as you mentioned, have voted early uh, by mail in, in this election. Uh, do you feel like that has changed campaigning? I mean, you said that Trump is, is in a way, you know, somewhat casting um, a little bit of a cloud of legitimacy over some of the mail-in um, ballots. Uh, how, how much has that changed this election with the amount of people that are voting early by mail? Oh, it's completely changed the dynamics, especially in, in kind of these states like Texas. So first of all, it, uh, it's made voting actually easier for a lot of people. You know, Americans don't have the day off on election day. A lot of working class people have to work that day. They have trouble getting to the polls. So I think one of the things you're seeing is actually a rise in the amount of people who are voting because it's easier to vote now with early uh, ballots, with mail-in ballots and so forth. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is like almost anything else in the United States, we're seeing a partisan divide. We're seeing that while Republicans don't fear the coronavirus, they feel like they can go to uh, the day of the election and just vote. On the other hand, Biden voters who are more wary, they want to stay at home, they're voting at a much higher rate. There's an estimate that about 70% of the early mail-in votings will be for the Democrats. And therefore, it's creating a political dynamic. And also, we'll see, as we'll talk about later, a uh, maybe a court battle over these mail-in ballots, because it's very clear that the Democrats want as many of these mail-in ballots to be counted, and the Republicans want as little. And I just want to make one thing clear so people know, there have been many studies that have been made, uh, MIT has made one and others, there's absolutely no evidence of voter fraud through mailing. It's, it's very safe. I think it's 0.0006% of uh, uh, votes that were casted in mail in previous elections were discovered to have some kind of problem with them. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be some politicking around these mail-in votes. Who gets the count? What if I mail my vote in two days before, but it arrives the day after? Does it count? Does it not count? We're going to see a lot of discussions about this if the election is closed. Right. Well, you, you mentioned it. I, I think you said, what, 70% of, of Democrats have been voting early. Uh, and, and, and I think I've read I've read a similar uh, study or a similar number of Republicans that plan to go vote in person tomorrow. So it seems like uh, we, we might get a, a bit of an influx of Republican votes that will be counted tomorrow and the Democrats will have their votes, kind of the, their, their influx of votes voted there, thereafter. Do you see that scenario where Trump might have good early results tomorrow? So it's, it's interesting, it's complicated, it depends where. In the Southern states that we mentioned before, which Trump needs to win all of these to have a chance. This is Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Georgia. There they have laws where they can process the mail-in votes before the actual day of the election. And therefore, we should actually see very early returns both of people who went on the day of the election and the mail-in votes. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in the key battleground states in the North, Michigan, Wisconsin, and especially Pennsylvania, there they have laws that they can't begin to count the mail-in votes until the day of the election. And therefore there, we absolutely will see probably an early lead for Trump that he might try to frame as a victory, but people are calling this a red mirage. You have to be patient. You have to wait for all the mail-in votes to count. And this is gonna take a few days. So if the election is close, chances are, it will not be, we will not know the winner by Tuesday night or by Wednesday morning. Uh, really, I think the only situation we're absolutely certain is a Biden landslide, which is a very uh, plausible scenario. He does have a large lead in the polls. But if it's close and we're waiting for Michigan, we're waiting for Pennsylvania, we're waiting for Wisconsin, this could take a few days. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the key demographics that you feel could still swing the results of this election right now? So yeah, so there are a number of ones. So first of all, if you look like a state of Florida, then it's the people who are above 65. Uh, last time, that was strong base of Trump support. 
But this, uh, this election, because of the coronavirus and their criticism of his treatment of it, they're worried, they're concerned about their health. And we've definitely seen in the polls a shift of older voters to Joe Biden. Joe Biden is someone they can connect to. He's their age. Uh, and so therefore, uh, he doesn't really create a problem for them. And in states like Florida, that can be crucial. Uh, another key demographic, as usual, is women, especially suburban women. Last time, one of the big surprises of the election was that Donald Trump ended up winning the white women vote uh, by 2% over Hillary Clinton, who was, of course, the first woman candidate to run for president. Uh, this time, the gender gap in the polls is the biggest I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this. Uh, I think the last time I checked, women are more likely to vote for Biden almost at 30%. It's incredible. If that stays and something doesn't change, then that's also a key demographic. And then the last one I'll mention, which is always important and always tricky, is can Joe Biden get low, uh, uh, low income and especially Hispanic and African-American voters who often don't come out and did not come out in two 2016, although they did come out for Barack Obama in 2008 and 12, that's one of the reasons he won. Can Joe Biden bring them out, especially can he bring out the Latino vote in places like Texas and Arizona which could really lead to a landslide that might change the dynamics of American politics, not just for the next four years, but for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that this election, it goes through Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, you know, arguably the most important, you know, state as in, in, in tomorrow's race. What are the, what are the key issues uh, for people in Pennsylvania? We hear a lot about fracking, right? Um, well, what are some of the other issues that, that, that seem to be a, a cause of discussion in that, in that particular state? It, it's a great question. So I think, first of all, you have to remember that Pennsylvania uh, is kind of like a microcosm of the United States. So you have rural areas that are very pro-Trump, and then you have urban areas that are very pro-Biden. And first of all, it's gonna be about turnout. So af obviously African-American voters in Philadelphia, they're very much concerned about police brutality. We, there was just last week or two weeks ago, there was rioting in Philadelphia after uh, there was a police killing of another African-American. So that's obviously a huge issue. Uh, in rural areas, on the other hand, I definitely think the fracking could play a role. Uh, those who don't know that there's a large contingent of rural people who are employed through fracking. And uh, but Joe Biden has discussed moving to greener energy and that might uh, lead to some unemployment problems for these people. And then more, more generally, it's the white working class. It's the places like Joe Biden's whole hometown, Scranton, Pennsylvania, which turned to Trump in 2016, mostly based on promises that he would kind of bring back the industry. He would kind of shut down the globalization, move the factories back from China to the United States, kind of make America great again in the sense that that industrial heartland would return. Uh, I don't think that's happened in the last few year, four years. There has been some return of manufacturing, but not a significant amount. So I think a lot of people will be discussing whether or not they think Trump can really deliver on these promises to bring back the industrial play base to these kind of old industrial towns like Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Democrats and, and, and Joe Biden have been, have been hitting hard on COVID, right? That is their, that is their main you know, messaging point. Um, and, and, and President Trump's handling of COVID. As we get into these fall and winter months, we're seeing an increase in the United States, Arizona, in key, key counties in Arizona, uh, around the Midwest, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin. How does the spike in COVID uh, affect this race and, and ultimately uh, impact Donald, uh, President Trump's uh, chances of reelection? I mean, they hurt his chances. Without a doubt, the number one issue in this election is COVID-19, is the treatment, I think uh, we've seen from the very beginning that the American people are napping happy with the, the way Trump has handled it. I think the fact that he got uh, the virus himself hurt him. Uh, and so absolutely, in many ways, that is the key issue. And there's almost nothing else on the table that really matters to voters as much as that. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, we also see how the, the COVID-19 has become a huge political issue again with things like the masks, the places where we're seeing the highest increases of COVID-19 are Republican areas because they aren't usually as uh, careful about wearing masks as the Democrats. And therefore, I'm definitely beginning to wonder, are as many Republicans, because remember, they did not mail in their votes, a lot of them, are they really as 
willing to go to the polls in the numbers that Trump needs? Or at the last second, are they actually going to have second thoughts because the virus is raging out of control in certain aspects where they, in certain places where they live? Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, last week, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, voted not to extend Wisconsin's deadline for receiving absentee ballots. I saw similar requests are being made in states like Pennsylvania and North Carolina. How significant is that and what could be the potential fallout? I mean, this is hugely significant. We talked again before about how the mail-in voting has become a partisan divide and how Democrats basically want them to count as many as possible and Republicans as little as possible. And here we also really see how politicized the courts have been. Uh, in his time in office, uh, Trump has managed because the Republicans control the Senate to, uh, 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 to add a number of Republican conservative judges to the courts. So I wouldn't be surprised if we've seen more decisions. On the other hand, we have to say that sometimes there are surprises and the Supreme Courts, especially the state Supreme Courts, won't go along with anything. Uh, so just a few days ago, uh, there was an attempt by some uh, local courts in Texas to cancel over 100,000 votes in Harris County, which is a very democratic county because they had done drive-through uh, mail-in voting. Uh, and then the Texas Supreme Court, which is a fairly conservative court, uh, rejected that and actually let those votes count. Uh, on the other hand, that issue could go back to the Supreme Court now, the American Supreme Court. And there, of course, we know that Trump has just uh, added another justice to the Supreme Court. Uh, she's considered a very, very conservative justice. And therefore, there are a lot of people who feel that if the vote is close, if this election is close, we might have a redux of Bush versus Gore in 2000, where, as everyone knows, Bush won the election mostly because he had a five to four advantage in the Supreme Court because the decision was made straightly on ideological lines regarding whether to have another recount in Florida or not. That is definitely a scenario that is on the table if this is a close election. And remind people how long that took in the, in the year 2000. How long did that whole Florida uh, legal battle with the recounts and, and, and they weren't able to, to, to identify the ballots? How long did that take? And, and if there is, um, legal challenges with the outcome of this election. What are we talking about? Are we talking about weeks? Could this be months? Could this be past January inauguration date? I don't know if it would be past January inauguration date because that would get tricky. But Florida, Bush versus Gore was decided in December, a month, mm -hmm. at least a month and a half, if I remember correctly, after the election took place. So this could be long, it could be drawn out. And now another important point to make, and this is actually why some Americans feel this is one of the scarier moments in American political history. And that is that the polarization is so large now and Democrats are so angry with the fact that Amy Comey Barrett was added to the court that you are not gonna see a situation like 2000 where Al Gore just accepted the decision of the court. That's not going to happen. Biden is not gonna just roll over this time. And therefore there are a lot of people who really are afraid of outbreaks of political violence, of protests, and really just a delegitimizing of the entire democratic process in the United States because there's such a high level of polarization about this election. Yeah, and are you, are you seeing either, either party, Democratic or Republican party kind of laying the groundwork in terms of their legal battle? I mean, are they doing anything to kind of prepare themselves for, for what might happen um, in, in the coming weeks? Well, as they say in America, they're lawyering up, that's for sure. I think there's a, a arms race now in getting the best lawyers, especially the Democratic uh, Party, which has a very bitter memory of 2000, where they feel that if they just handled the situation better, uh, for those who don't recall, uh, Al Gore actually calls, concedes the race to Bush, then he calls him back, says, I take it back. And then later he also made some key strategical errors about which counties to ask for a recount. So absolutely, there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of lawyers making a lot of extra money on their retainer if, in fact, that happens. But I do want to remind people that if you just look strictly at the polls, this is an unlikely scenario. The most likely scenario is that Biden is going to have a large enough lead to avoid this kind of, you know, very contested election that could go on for weeks. Fascinating, and we are in not you know we are we are in for uh for 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 an exciting uh, a week. It won't be a dull week. It won't be a dull couple of weeks. Uh, very eager to see what happens tomorrow. Um, 
I hope everybody uh, remains, you know, safe. And I hope that uh, whatever, if there is a transition of power or not, that, that uh, you know, the results are, are accepted and, um, and, and we can, uh, we can, we can move, move along the, the democratic process. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it, we, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for speaking to us during this crucial time, providing your insight into tomorrow's US presidential election. Uh, to our viewers, if you have any questions at all for, uh, for Professor Cook, please do leave them in the comments section of this video or feel free to email them to info at asuh.org and we'll pass them along. Uh, we'll be back with Professor Cook on Wednesday to unpack the initial results from November 3. So uh, be sure to tune into that at the same time, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. in Israel for another, uh, for another special briefing hosted by the American Society of the University of Haifa. Um, Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you again, Professor. And uh, if you haven't done so yet, please make sure to get out and vote. Thanks again. Thank you.